Hey everybody, welcome to Phalanx Frequency, the channel where all we talk about is aircraft maintenance for aircraft owners. In today's episode, we're gonna talk about aircraft oil, uh, specifically piston aircraft engines, uh, aircraft oil filters. Um, we're gonna talk about our picks for filters and oil. We'll talk about the importance of aircraft oil and um, yeah, just kind of talk about what, what you would need to know as a pilot uh, about why aviation oil is so important for your engine and why oil is important for an aircraft engine. As you guys already know, I got my clipboard. I always have a clipboard here and uh, that is how I go through and get through the lesson and stay on topic without rambling. <clears throat> There's always a little bit of rambling, but um, I stay on topic with the clipboard. So I have my clipboard today and um, we're going to start out with the purpose of aircraft oil. Uh, so aircraft oil, believe it or not, has multiple purposes. It's not just to lubricate. A lot of people just think it's lubricate, but uh, aircraft oil uh, has three main purposes or three main functions to perform in your piston aircraft engine. Uh, one's to cool, one's to create a barrier, and one is to suspend. So we'll start out with cooling. Um, Aircraft engines, piston aircraft engines, the majority of them uh, are air-cooled. Um, there are some engines that are liquid-cooled, you know, in World War II. There's, there are lots of interesting designs, but I'm going to speak in particular to Lycoming and Continental Recip inline engines, or excuse me, opposed engines. Uh, and most of these engines are air-cooled. Uh, the way you can kind of tell an air-cooled engine typically is by the amount, the cylinder fins uh, on the engine. Um, that Those fins are designed to dis dissipate heat. So the more surface area the cylinder has, the easier it can dissipate heat. And, those, and the air flowing through the cylinders helps bring heat away from the engine. So the fins on an on aircraft cylinder are designed to dissipate heat. And that's kind of one major... Uh, way you can tell that an aircraft is simply uh, air-cooled, not liquid-cooled. But uh, for air-cooled engines, like most of the Lycoming and uh, piston engines out there, uh, aircraft oil plays an important role in keeping the uh, engine cool as well. Uh, as the oil circulates through the engine, it comes in contact with a lot of different metal parts, and those metal parts are getting hot uh, from the byproduct of combustion or when, when combustion happens in the engine, the engine gets hot. Uh, aircraft oil will circulate through the engine. Uh, the heat will transfer to the oil, and typically the oil runs through a cooler, an oil cooler. And that oil cooler is a uh, oil to air cooler, or it uses air as well to pass through uh, the oil cooler to cool the oil inside the oil cooler. I hope you guys are following me on all this. <clears throat> Long story short, oil helps Cool, keep the engine cool as well. Uh, as it circulates through the engine, it goes through an oil cooler. The oil cooler then has air ducted to it, kind of like a radiator. And as the air passes through the oil cooler, it, the oil is going through the oil cooler and the air goes through the fins of the oil cooler and dissipates the heat from the oil. Um, so and then the oil goes back into the engine for circulation. So... Um, Oil has a great purpose of keeping the aircraft engine cool. If you have uh, an oil temp gauge in your aircraft, um, you know, it's good to stay in tune with that. Oil pressure is obviously the most important, but oil temp's good too. Anything from like 190 uh, to like 210, and different aircraft will have, different engines will have different um, operating ranges, but a good temp is like 190 to uh, 190 to 210 indicated. Uh, the reason why is because that that temperature range is a good range when you're up at cruise and your engine's at full warmth of uh, the operating temperature. Uh, that is the temperature in which water will boil off because um, oil the indicated temperature the oil may get 10 20 degrees hotter than that. Than what your gauge says because the gauge is depending on where the, the sensor is on the engine for the gauge the oil touching that sensor may it may not be at its hottest point when it hits that sensor so that sensor may be picking it up when it's 10 or 15 or 20 degrees cooler than the oil actually gets and so 190 to 210 that area is a good range to be in because 
it boils off the water and it's great to uh, burn off the moisture in your oil when you're operating your engine. <clears throat> okay, uh, the next, I did say barrier, so I'm gonna go, uh, the three purposes of aircraft oil, cool, suspend, and be a barrier. Okay, let's go to barrier next. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mark off cool because we're done with that. Barrier, okay. Um, in an aircraft engine, there are a lot of mo moving parts, metal parts, uh, and the oil uh, is routed to these parts via galleys, channels. Um, it's slung onto these parts inside the crate case as the crank's um, being turned. Uh, it will throw oil up into these parts as well. And there's designs of like pistons and cylinders. They're, they're designed in a way to kind of um, get oil on them to keep them cool and keep them lubricated. Uh, barrier is the purpose of oil is also to be a barrier between metals. So uh, crank bearings, cam shafts, uh, piston to cylinder wall. These are all areas where oil helps prevent metal to metal contact. And what it does is pr uh, creates a film, a barrier between the two metals. Therefore, the metals never really touch. You know, that's the key. If you can get it to where uh, most of these engines are designed to have as much of that as possible, where the oil acts as the anti-friction surface, or it acts as a, a barrier to keep the metals from touching each other. Um, because if the metals start touching or touching too much, and there's too much pressure between the two, obviously wear starts to happen. Um, it, like uh, in the case of camshafts, it's a very, uh, <clears throat> that's a high pressure area on the cam lobe where the cam follower tap it rides along the cam lobe. That creates a lot of high pressure there. Having a good coat of oil on it helps uh, keep a barrier between the two metals to keep the metal from uh, wearing off. So oil acts as a barrier. That's another key part of aviation oil. Okay, the third thing for aviation oil, the third purpose so we got cool, it cools the engine, it acts as a barrier between metal parts, and then third is suspend. This is um, kind of, all these are, uh, they seem pretty obvious and they, um, they make sense, right? You know, suspend is, the, uh, the oil uh, helps keep all the combustion by byproducts. So when your engine ignites, when um, combustion happens in your engine, when it creates power, it's, an, it's a controlled explosion, okay? And the oil, uh, some of the oil gets exposed to this controlled uh, burn or the explosion happening inside your aircraft engine. Excuse me for my terminology here, but to create power, your piston engine has to have a controlled explosion, essentially, on the combustion stroke of the force cycles of the engine. Okay, uh, the, it's not super, it's not completely tight meaning that some of the, um, there's a blow-by past the piston that gets into the crankcase, that gets into oil, okay? So that's why oil gets dark. You know, when you have brand new oil, it's, it's clear, it's transparent. When it's 50 hours or 25 hours, whatever you're doing for an oil change, uh, it's dark, right? That oil is suspending all the byproducts of combustion, carbon, um, and I don't know all the, the byproducts, they're not good. Uh, carcinogens, whatever is in the, the when the combustion happens, uh, the oil's job is to take that stuff and suspend it in, its, in the oil and keep it in the oil, keep it retained in the oil. And that's why it's so important to have uh, your oil changed frequently because what you do is you drain that stuff out of the engine and fill it with fresh new oil. Uh, if you keep not, if you keep oil in there and you keep running it, eventually, um, it becomes too suspended and the oil can't perform its job of cooling and acting as a barrier because its properties change too much. Uh, if it's always holding on to all the combustion byproducts, it's not going to be able to perform its other duties, cooling and acting as a barrier. So suspending oil, uh, and sorry, you may have heard that in the background. That's, we have a, a furnace by us here and it, it turns on and off. So, uh, but Oil acts as a barrier, um, or excuse me, oil, oil suspends combustion byproducts. That's why oil gets dark. 
Okay, so we went over the three areas of oil, uh, cooling, uh, suspending, and be being a barrier between the metal parts. Okay, so um, let's move on to the next thing. I, I, you know, I thought back to when I was in school, uh, A&P school, because I know we went over this stuff, and that was a long time ago. Uh, and I thought there was a fourth one. I really did. I thought there was a fourth reason for oil, and it escapes my mind right now. Uh, and I thought about it when I was writing this, this uh, script up. And for the life of me, I couldn't think of it. So if there's a mechanic out there, or a shop, or somebody out there that knows the fourth reason for oil, uh, we got cool, we got being a barrier, we got suspending oil, give us a shout. Uh, hit, up, hit us up on our um, YouTube channel or on our website, failingsaviation.com. Let us know. Okay, next topic, oil filter versus oil screen. <clears throat> so uh, piston aircraft engines, and as I was saying before, I'll speak to Lycoming and Continentals. Uh, opposed engines partic in particular. Um, the way that they filter out the, the particulates in oil um, is through screening or filtering. Okay, most of these engines have a sump screen and at, in the oil sump where the oil sets, whether it's a wet sump or a dry sump, a wet sump is most common. It's where the sump is, the, where the oil lives when the engine is in the bottom of the engine and that's the sump. Uh, it's usually attached to the engine. That's a wet sump. A dry sump for a piston engine is where the oil reservoir is located separate of the engine. Sometimes in older planes, uh, you'll see that there's an oil sump somewhere else. Uh, turbines are like that too. Turbine aircraft, are, a lot of turbines are like that. Or at least uh, helicopters are. I can't speak to big jets, but um, because I haven't worked on big jets that much. Uh, but like the Bell 206 has a remote oil reservoir. And so what I'm getting at here is, without going on another tangent, dry sump versus wet sump. A wet sump, the oil is with the engine. It's attached to the engine just like an automotive engine. The sump's at the bottom. A dry sump, the oil reservoir is rem uh, located remotely from the engine. Okay? So uh, the first source of screening for continentals and lycomings of your oil before it goes out and lubricates the engine. So it, the oil's living in the bottom of the oil sump. Uh, when you fire up your engine, your oil pump starts turning. Uh, and when it starts turning, it starts sucking oil up through the pickup tube. There's usually a, a, a coarse screen or a, a screen in the oil sump that will filter out bigger oil pieces or carbon pieces or metal or whatever shouldn't go through the pump right it's gonna it's a screen so it's not a filter it, it doesn't get changed as often as a filter it should be inspected um and we'll get into that but uh it will filter out larger pieces so right away engine starts oil comes up uh gets through the pickup tube goes through an initial screen then goes up through to the oil pump and then so the oil pump doesn't typically get filtered oil or the second screening of oil. It usually just gets one uh, filter in these lycoming continentals. It usually just gets uh, the pickup tube screen filtered oil. Then it goes up to the oil pump. And then after the oil pump, it'll go through a full flow cartridge filter or a screen, uh, a high mesh screen, a uh, really small mesh screen, I should say. And that depends on what kind of uh, setup you have on your aircraft. Um, I've, I've done oil changes on both planes multiple times. The screen is obviously where you have, it's usually this stuff's on the back of the engine for continentals and lycomings. The screen and the oil filter are located on the rear of the engine on the accessory case usually. And a screen is where you pull the, it's a literally a metal screen and you pull it out of the back of the engine and you inspect it and you clean it and you put it back in. Okay. Usually uh, it's every 25 hours. So, and I recommend sticking to these 25 hours. If you can go a little short, it's never gonna hurt your engine to change your oil more frequently. I can't think of any reason why, other than you're going in there and doing things all the time. And every time you go in and do something, you do open up uh, the opportunity to make a mistake. But as far as if you're good about doing oil changes, <clears throat> excuse me, 
If you do your oil changes five to 10 hours before the recommended time period, it's gonna be better than if you do it at the recommended time period. Um, so screens every 25 hours located on the back of the engine, pull the screen off, uh, inspect, clean, put it back on, uh, safety wire, new copper gasket. Usually they have a crush gasket around the screen housing or the screen um, area where it seats to the engine. So you want to have, if you're doing screens and you have that for your setup, make sure you get in the parts catalog. You look up the copper washer that goes in between the screen and the accessory case and buy 25 of those. You know, get a pack of them and, and then have those on hand and then have 0.32 safety wire. Um, that's uh, soft stainless steel, soft steel. It's just 0.32 safety wire. If you Google that, it'll come up. So those are the two materials you'll need to do the screen. Okay, uh, oil filter. Oil filters filter the metal or filter the oil a little bit better. So their oil change frequency is increased to 50 hours. So uh, with an oil filter, you don't have to change it till 50 hours most of the time for Lycoming and Continentals. The oil filter is usually located in the same area as the screen um, generally. Uh, it's usually on the back of the engine on the accessory case. And with that, you uh, are gonna to wanna to get oil filters for your type of engine. There are plenty of application charts and I'll link to one in um, our podcast uh, episode. So you can get a link below to that. But um, you're gonna want oil filters on hand and then you're gonna want 0.32 safety wire still. And that's uh, what you'll need to do oil changes. You'll need some tools too. And we can list, we can list what you need for an oil change uh, below this video so check it out we'll have links to the stuff you need <clears throat> but uh so the difference between a screen and a filter uh screen you got to change more often because it's not as it's not going to filter the metal as much and then or filter the oil as much i don't know why i keep saying that and then an oil filter uh is you're going to be able to go to 50 hours you're not going to change your oil as frequently okay um if you're kind of a cost guru, I mean like the pros and cons, the screen, uh, you're not buying filters over and over. Okay. So you kind of are a little bit cheaper on the parts, 20, 30 bucks every change on the screen, but you, the physical part of going in there and changing it every time is like twice as much cause it's half, it's 25 hours versus 50. Right. So if your time's not as valuable, then maybe a screen. Right. And then for filters, Obviously, you have to buy a new filter every time, okay? And uh, you got to cut the filter and open it up and inspect it. And we'll do a different um, episode on oil filters and opening them up and what to look at and that kind of thing. So stay in, stay in tune with us. Subscribe to the Phalanx Frequency channel. Uh, we'll cover oil filters when you cut them and open them in detail in another episode. Uh, but as far as um, what's better... Uh, I think the filter is, my opinion is, um, and I've seen multiple cases when uh, we've, like Continental, and I, I don't have this service bulletin on my top of my hands, but I do remember doing a P-Ponk install on a fresh overhaul on a Continental motor, and I don't know if it was Continental that re uh, spelled this out, but they said, hey, uh, we extend the TBO of the engine if you, if you install a full flow cartridge filter um, I think it was like 100 or 200 hours. So they were basically saying, if you put a filter on it, we'll extend the TBO. That tells me that uh, the filter is a better option. It's more superior in filtering the oil than a, a screen. So, and I'm sure Lycoming has something out there maybe similar saying that. And if they don't, well, Continental did. And I remember, this was a long time ago when I did this uh, particular engine install, but I remember that coming up. So we bought an Airwolf oil separator because... Um, or an Airwolf oil filter kit, remote oil filter kit. Because on this installation, we were installing a, a, it was a 470, got converted to a 520. It was a P-Punk upgrade on a 182. And uh, at the time of overhaul, it, the engine needed overhauled. So it got overhauled, it got upgraded to the P-Punk. And then um, at that same time, we were looking at TBO extensions for the engine. And one of them, it had a screen on it to start. Um, and it said, hey, if you put a full flow filter on it, We'll increase it by 200 hours. So we put an Airwolf remote oil filter kit on it. Uh, that helped us uh, change the oil on that plane faster. It made, it, you essentially an Airwolf 
remote oil filter kit. I'm not getting paid by them. I'm just trying to tell you what uh, makes your life easier. It is a kit that you install on your engine and it, it relocates the filter to where you want to put it. Makes your oil changes way easier. And uh, they used to be like seven, 800 bucks. I haven't looked at the price recently, but um, for the kit, depending on your engine, then you buy your own hoses so you can take it and put it wherever you want. But I mean, like, uh, I recommend that to all aircraft owners that have like um, 0470s or uh, even the Bonanzas, the 520s, 550s, just because it reduces the mess of the oil change and it makes oil changes easier and faster. It's going to pay off in the long run. So remote oil fil filter kits, look them up, uh, Airwolf. Okay. Um, next topic is oil analysis. Um, we're going to combine oil fil in inspecting oil filters and oil analysis in another episode. It'll it'll be down the road. I got to write the script up to up for it, and I've got to go into uh, the topics we'll discuss. But essentially, an oil filter analysis is um, a great a little piece of added insurance uh, for 30, 40, 50 bucks. And I I'm throwing these prices out because they change frequently. So I'm, I'm referencing them now. They may change in price down the road. Um, it's, it just turned, it's, it's January 2nd, 2023. So just turned over the new year. Prices may change, but it's not that much is what I'm getting at. And they measure the metal count in the oil in parts per million. So it's a very fine count of metal in the engine. Uh, your aircraft engine has multiple metals in it, right? Aluminum, steel, uh, bronze or Babbitt. Uh, these are all metals in the engine and you can often tell what is wearing or what is becoming a problem in an oil filter analysis or an oil analysis because it tells the metal counts of each metal in your engine. Um, silica too, that's dirt. It just counts like how much dirt was in your engine or just a uh, byproduct, I guess. But anyway, long story short, Great little piece of insurance. You need to have about two or three oil analysis done on your engine to get a trend. Um, so oil change 50 hours, get an oil analysis. Next oil change uh, at 50 hours, get an oil analysis. Next oil change at 50 hours, get an oil analysis. At that point, you'll have three analysis. You will be able to develop a trend because each engine is a little different in their counts, right? The, the counts of metal each engine produces. But once you establish a good trend, then you keep changing the oil. And if you want to switch it out to do every other oil change, you can do that where you do oil analysis, or you can do it every oil change. But the extra 40 bucks to do the oil analysis is cheap insurance to monitor your engine in, a, in an additional way to find out a problem before it becomes a real problem. And uh, the reports are super slick. I'll go ahead and link to an example report but they essentially, they go out to a lab. There's tons of suppliers. We'll, we'll link to the different oil analysis kits below. But um, long story short, you, you, when you're changing your oil, you get a little bottle or your little sample and you dump the oil and you, you take a little sample of the oil as it's draining. You box it up. You send it out to one of these labs. And a lot of them are prepaid postage. That's what we like to get. You send it out to a lab. They... Uh, put it through their lab, and then they send you back a PDF report of the metal count of all the metals in your engine. And they'll put uh, um, typical metal for that kind of engine because they have a database of tons of engines. So they're able to tell you, hey, this looks a little off. This doesn't look off. You know, this is normal. And you'll get a nice clean PDF report back that'll tell you the metals your engines are making, your engine is making. I. We don't do oil analysis typically until our engines hit TBO. Um, unless the owner requests it, we're always gonna be a proponent of it, but we don't see it necessary um, until you hit TBO. Or if you have a high performance engine, that's a good time to do it too, like a turbocharged one to, to put it on a, if there's, there's a lot of reasons to put an engine on an oil analysis. Uh, if it's turbocharged, if it's um, past TBO, if it has history you don't know about, um, it has a lot of years since overhaul. Maybe it's like 30, 40 years since overhaul, but it's only got like 500 hours, uh, since major overhaul operating time. You know, there's a lot of variables, but if you're ever in question about your engine, get it on an oil, oil analysis program. 
have your A&P view it. If he can't review it, have like a guy like us, Phalanx Aviation or Mike Bush, have us analyze it because have someone that knows what they're looking at, but it's pretty easy to read. You know, if you get a spike in one of the metal areas, it'll, it'll show up in the PDF report and I recommend it. I recommend oil uh, analysis. Uh, I'm going to just briefly make sure I'm hitting everything up. Okay, let's, I, I got everything on oil analysis. We'll cover that more in our other episode with oil filters. But let's move on to turbocharged engines. I wanted to touch on that because <clears throat> turbocharged engines uh, obviously are a little higher performing, whether they're normalized or actually turbocharged. And normalized just means it brings up the engine pressure, the manifold pressure to 29.92. Uh, actual truly turbocharged engine, <coughs> excuse me, will push it past 29.92 atmospheric pressure. Either way, you're pressurizing the engine to give it more induction, more pressure, more power. Um, these engines run, the turbo area runs hot, very hot. And the main source of lubrication for the turbo is the oil, okay? Uh, just this is I tried finding some exact RPM numbers so uh, I'm waiting for someone on YouTube just try to you know to not try to but to correct me on these things but I do know that I'm in the range and I've you know I've been in the industry long enough to know that uh, the concept that I'm telling you is important the very particular details it's going to change per engine to engine I understand that but I can tell you this engine RPM on a Lycoming or Continental is going to go uh, 2300 to 2700 2800 if it's re if it's got a reduction gear or if it's got uh if it's a geo series a geared engine uh maybe it'll spin a little faster right 3200 something like that this is rpm your engine is actually spinning the crank okay so let's just give it a range of 2300 because it'll go all the way down to zero when it's shut off but in cruise let's say 2300 to 3200 2000 five or 2300 to 3200 rpm your engine is turning okay a turbo is going to run like 40,000 to like 80,000 rpm and i give it such a range because every engine is different i couldn't really find anything online that told me a very particular amount for a turbo lycoming or continental but i can tell you that they're spinning fast much faster than your engine is and uh, we're talking about the turbo uh, exhaust and intake prop uh, propeller of the engine, or excuse me, of the turbo. Uh, that, that turbo is spooling up and jamming air into your engine. So it's, it's spinning very fast. And um, the main bearing of these turbos is lubricated by the engine oil. Not anything new. It's not anything different. It's the same engine oil you put in to lubricate your engine. So there's two very wide range of RPMs and the, the bearing design is different in the turbo, obviously. But what I'm getting at is change your oil frequently if you have a turbocharged engine. It's not going to hurt anything to change it at 30 hours versus 50 hours and you're going to extend the life of the turbo. Uh, so my only thing is, is if you have a turbocharged engine, give it a little attention because it's running a little hotter. It's got a component in it, the turbo that needs to be lubricated a little more and um it, it has more demands for lubrication so don't don't short it don't short your turbo okay let's go on to the next topic let's see we're done with done with one page we only have two we only have two pages so we're halfway through approximately probably a little more okay oil grades and temperatures so um the next topic's multi-viscosity oil so these two kind of blend together so i'll kind of push them together but uh let me make sure i'm not jumping ahead okay uh it's preferred by my recommendation is to run a straight oil if you can if you want to if you have the extra energy to switch if you once again <laughs> there's so many variables okay it depends on where you operate your aircraft normally okay if you spend most of your time and your your aircraft is operating in a place like arizona hot and dry and it's 70 degrees above most of the time then you go with a, a weight that accommodates that a single grade weight that will accommodate that 
like 100 or 120 weight oil, okay? Straight, straight weight oil. Uh, that's my recommendation. Um, and if you get to a place where it's colder, you can always plug an engine heater in to get the viscosity a little thinner for startup. But long story short, um, there's single grades and multi-grade weights or uh, multi there's single grade and multi viscosity oils right the single grade is just one grade oil it's got one viscosity it's it's designed to operate within a certain temperature range a link to the aero shell uh, temperature range below it's a chart that tells you what grade of oil you need for what temperature range you're operating in and uh i've been told and I'm not a chemist, I'm not an engineer, I'm an AMPIA, I base my, uh, I base all my education off of uh, examples or real life experience, right? And then if an old timer comes up and tells me something, I'm going to obviously listen to that too. But um, I've been told by lots of people that single grade is the best way to go, just because the engine was designed for single grades, these piston engines were. But, um, so it's like, Okay, use that if you if you can. But I'm gonna go ahead and say that uh, I was part of a flight school for a while, a partner, and I sold out of it. But I, I still stay in tune with the flight school, and we've seen thousands of operating hours. And we run Philips XC 20W50 in all of our four-cylinder Lycoming engines, and in really any engine, unless there's a reason to run something different. So our default oil of choice is Philips XC 20W50. Once again. Uh, as of right now, I haven't reached out to Phillips and asked them to pay me or anything. I'm just, this is based off of our experience. Uh, I'm not getting, uh, influenced to be saying that, uh, this is just based off of the 13, 14 years of maintenance that I've seen planes come through the shop, the flight school. And we like Phillips XC 20W50 because it's multi-viscosity, meaning we don't have to worry about switching our, our oil weights back and forth. We operate in uh, the Midwest of the United States, Iowa, uh, Minnesota, Kansas. That's where the flight schools were, and that's where most of our customer aircraft are. Or excuse me, Missouri. And the temperature, if anybody knows, it changes. We got, we got seasons. We got four seasons. So, like, the temperatures can get way cold. They can get really hot. And with that, you need an oil that can adapt to the whole range. And uh, so we do uh, Phillips XC. 20w50 oil and so far uh we also had uh, a reputable engine overhauler tell us the same thing that they they like that oil as well and so we kind of leaned towards that uh and we started putting in all of our engines and so far i mean we've been doing it for five or six years exclusively running that oil and there's some cases where we'll put aero shell in it or if uh, the owner wants a particular oil in their engine we'll change we'll put whatever oil they want uh, but for us, it's worked great. When we tear the engine down, it looks great. Um, they last beyond TBO. There's a lot of reasons other than oil why it wouldn't last uh, to TBO, but the oil, we see good results out of Phillips. Um, so Phillips is a multi-viscosity, like I said. It's great because at startup temps or cold temps, it, it's designed to operate at low temps. It's designed to operate at high temps, okay? So it can operate the whole range. And the equivalent to Philips uh, 20W50 Aeroshell brand would be 15W50, Aeroshell 15W50. Uh, so that's a multi-viscosity. It can be operated in all temps as well. We just stuck with the Philips. But either product is meets the same. And I have that right, that uh, both these oils meet the same ASE and mil specs. And that is basically the level of certification they have to meet. So they're both good to go in piston engines. You're not going to blow up your engine if you choose one or the other. Uh, unless you're always going to want to follow what the engine manufacturer says, but if you can't find that, then it's the, either of those oils are they're the same mill spec, so they're going to work. I'm going to run through the, the weights and the temperature ranges real quick. Uh, so if you're running, if you're super cold and you're negative 12 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, a 65 weight is going to be good. If you're one degree to 69 degrees Fahrenheit, an 80 weight would be preferred. If you're 60 degrees to 89 degrees Fahrenheit, a hundred weight would be great. And then 120 weight for uh, aircraft or ambient air temperatures of above 78 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So there's your weights, there's the temp ranges. We'll go ahead and link to a temperature chart below as well. <clears throat> Um, so moving on, our pick for aviation oil and oil filters. Okay. I told you that, uh, we like Phillips XC 20W50 is our pick of oil. Uh, and, um, the standard that I was talking about is ASC standard J1899. So that is the standard that the aviation oils have to meet. If it meets that standard, it's good to go in your piston aircraft engine. Uh, I remember when ExxonMobil was a thing, and I think they discontinued it, but they had a multi-viscosity oil too. And so uh, I haven't heard from them, uh, but um, you know, depending on what uh, oil you have, just make sure it checks out on J18, ASC standard J1899. Okay, our pick is Phillips XC 20W50. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Our oil filter pick is Tempest. And uh, we don't really, it's not like we absolutely hate Champion. We just had, we've always had better service with Tempest, customer service. They're a smaller company, so we do support smaller companies. Um, they were cheaper. Uh, that wasn't the main reason why we chose it. We're going to always choose a good product. And Tempest product is good. It's a good product. It's always worked for us. I think from cutting these filters enough, Champion makes a thicker uh, outer case on their filter. And so their burst pressure is a little higher, I think. But I can't think of a time when you're going to hit that burst pressure. You know, I don't know um, when you're going to hit that. But we've ran Tempest and we continue to run Tempest. Uh, we'll do another series talking about oil, oil filters, and oil analysis. And in that, we'll go ahead and get into the, the um, design of each and talk about why one might be better than the other. But I think if you're doing filters, if you're doing either or, it doesn't matter. Uh, we've, you're not, once again, you're not going to blow up your engine either way. Uh, so um, recently, we just had an oil filter shortage where we couldn't get oil filters for any engines. And it went on for three or four months. So get whatever oil filters you can. Sometimes that's the name of the game. Um, okay, my last and final topic is how to perform an oil change. Now, before I go into that, I do film most of my stuff in the studio. Uh, I am looking forward to getting out in the field and showing you guys some stuff. We have, we have mechanics all over the country. And I get out and do some maintenance too when the jobs are in the Des Moines area or a little, sometimes if it's closer, I'll go out and do it. And I do help with the flight school locally here. So uh, I'm just, uh, it's a new um, way for me to go out and film in the, uh, in the field. And uh, I talked with a guy that I work with frequently. I said, I wish I would have filmed the thousands of hours of shot time that I've had because uh, now I'm catching up to the filming and I would have had so much great content to share with you guys had I just strapped a camera to my head or something and filmed all the experience. But, you know, we're catching up to it now. So what I'm saying is um, I, I haven't, depending on how I edit this video, I may throw in some slides. I'll look at some pictures I have of oil changes and kind of give you some more pictures. But there's some good YouTube videos out there, I think, of people changing oil and uh, they kind of are at the plane, they show you what to do. So mine's more of just gonna tell you how to do it, right? Um, and I'll try to throw in some pictures too. And the moral of the story is, I'm gonna try to get out in the field. It's just a different dynamic. I wanna make sure I produce a good video. So I don't wanna just go out there and film some crap. I wanna get some, I, some good equipment and get it set up right. So it's just a little more effort, but we're gonna get there. So how to perform an oil change? First, run the engine uh, around the patch. Get it up to oil temp. Fly it around the patch. Uh, get the engine up to temp, right? Okay, drain the oil. When you're draining the oil, take an oil sample. Usually you let the oil drain, a couple quarts drain out before you take the sample, but get your sample, okay? Set your sample aside. Now drain the oil filter. Now, some planes, you might not have to do this, but what I'm getting at is it's a rookie mistake to fire up your engine, have a bunch of oil going through the filter, and then you spin the filter off and it makes a mess. Oil goes everywhere. So, 
Uh, when you fire up, if you're going to warm up your engine, which some shops don't do that, you know, they'll do an oil change. They don't even warm up the oil and, and it's not the right way to do it. So uh, you're supposed to run the engine before you do an oil change. <clears throat> okay. Uh, drain the oil filter. Uh, with that, you can either let the plane set for uh, 15, 20 minutes. Just let the oil filter set. Don't touch it. Um, that will let oil drain it back in. Or you can poke the oil filter with a punch. Like we usually will take a punch and a hammer and poke a hole in the back of the oil filter. This is especially important for Continental uh, or Bonanzas that have the oil filter upside down in the back of the engine because, <coughs> excuse me, if you lift that, if you go to spin that oil filter off just after you ran it, you're going to get oil all over the place. If you poke a hole with a punch and a hammer in the top of the filter, it'll let air into the filter and let the oil drain back into the engine. So it'll save you a lot of time. After you poke the hole in the oil filter, wait 10 minutes. Just wait. Let the oil drain out. And then I recommend you either put uh, paper towels or a Ziploc baggie underneath the oil filter. That's going to catch any oil that's going to come out of the filter. This is how we do oil filter changes. I'm not... Uh, there's, you can, you know what, if you want to go after it and go, uh, balls the wall and screw off the filter right after you ran it, go ahead because you can get the oil change done that way too. You're just going to have a bigger mess to clean up. That's all. Or you don't even have to clean up the mess, whatever. So we recommend getting some paper towels and a Ziploc baggie under the filter, uh, and, uh, to help catch the, any oil that does come out of the filter. Okay. Remove the filter. Uh, so what you do, you take the filter, remove it. We have an oil drain area for our filters in our shop, but uh, essentially turn the filter upside down, either in a five gallon bucket or an oil dr dr uh, drain pan or somewhere where it can finish draining. Just set it aside, let it drain. We put the tail number on the filter uh, just because we want to make sure we don't mix it with other planes. We have, we run a shop, so there's multiple planes going at once. Um, to remove the filter, you're going to need to cut the safety wire, uh, safety wire, get a pair of dikes and cut the safety wire. And on light combing engines, do not break the safety wire off by grabbing the safety wire and, and twisting it out of that little hole that's drilled on the back of the, um, in, in accessory case. You're going to break that hole out eventually. So just cut the safety wire at both ends and take the safety wire off the filter. Then the filter, you can get a one inch, uh, we like to use a one inch wrench or a one inch socket and long breaker bar to get the filter loose. Make sure you hold the socket or wrench where it goes onto the filter, hold it on there with your hand and use your other hand to turn it because this part on the filter could slip off. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, after the oil is drained all out of the sump, because at this point you would have drained the oil, the way we drain oil is we got a hose, we stick it to the sump, we put it in a five gallon bucket and let it drain. It's going to drain fast because if it's warm, it's going to drain quickly. Uh, cold oil always takes a lot longer to drain. Um, so here is one that doesn't get done often. I recommend you do it every other oil change or as frequently as you can possibly do it. Do it some at some point. Try to do this on a constant, uh, reoccurring basis. And everything I say is trumped by the aircraft engine, the aircraft manual and the engine manual. Manuals in general trumped what I say. I'm just telling you some advice here. Okay, there's an oil sump screen in the bottom of the oil that we talked about earlier in this episode. You want to take that out and inspect that screen. Okay. Usually on Lycoming's and Continent, they're both engines. It's in the oil sump. It's usually at the bottom of the sump. It's at the back of the sump. It's got a copper washer on it. It's safety wired to the engine sump, cut the safety wire, pull that out, inspect it, clean it, put it back in, take pictures. If you have questions about anything, take good high quality pictures of the screen. That way you have something to reference before. And after, let's say you got a question about some metal or something, you can, if it's really bad, your A&P is going to look at it and say, nah, we need to figure this out. But if it's not bad, you can get a picture of what it was 
and then if you do it change it later you have that picture to reference back at that way you can see if it's getting worse or better the the whatever is in the screen okay uh, so at this point oil's been drained filters in the back uh, somewhere it's draining out itself we've checked this the sump screen put the sump screen back in the oil uh, sump safety wire torque it safety it Lycoming engine manual will tell you the torques. Uh, I don't know the torque offhand on the sump screen. <clears throat> but uh, once the sump screen's back in the engine, now let's put a new filter on the engine. Uh, Tempest has this new easy spin filter that doesn't need lube on the seal. I don't know. I Sometimes I just feel like I've done it so much that I put a little bit of oil on the seal. So either way, just you can put a little oil around the seal of the uh, filter, the, the rubber seal, spin the filter on the uh, where it needs to go on the engine, torque it to 17 foot-pounds, or whatever the filter says. The filter usually says the torque on the filter. Uh, use a torque wrench. You can get torque wrenches at Amazon for pretty cheap. You can get a dedicated torque wrench for oil filters, for oil changes, and uh, torque the filter and safety wire it. Now, safety wiring needs to be done in the direction of tightening. You never want safety wire to be pulling the filter loose. You want the safety wire to be pulling it tight. Okay. Um, all right. So your uh, your sump screen's back in. Your filter's on. Your oil's been drained. Now you top it off with oil. Put whatever your preferred choice of oil is back in the engine. We typically fill it a quart or two short of what the full sump capacity is depends on the engine depends on if you're going to go on a long cross country but for example lycoming engines have most of them have an eight a lot of them have an eight quart sump we'll do seven okay because it the engine will throw out through the oil or through the crankcase breather it will blow out some oil if you overfill it so we just uh, do seven quarts on lycomings and if you're doing like if we do big bore continentals, it's usually a quart shy too. So uh, a lot of 12 quart sumps out there for the continentals, we'll do 11. Okay, once you do that, then you're going to go ahead and uh, you got your screen in, your oil sump screen, you've got your filter on, torqued and safety wired. You've got the engine full of oil. Go out, run it up, make sure it doesn't leak. The key to leak checking is to wipe the filter off that you installed. If your oil filter that you installed has oil on it, then how are you going to know it's leaking oil? Because it's all oily before you even started. So dry off the oil filter. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, paper towels and 409 or degreaser or carb spray, whatever you want to do, just get rid of the oil around the filter. If you've got oil in other places, you don't have to clean the whole engine down. Just clean off the filter and make sure you can take a look at the filter before you run it. And I always feel around the base of the filter to make sure, hey, there's no oil. I don't feel any oil on my fingers. That tells me if I run the engine and I feel oil afterwards, there might be a little leak. Okay, so get a baseline. Find out, make sure there's no oil leaking from the filter. Make sure there's no oil on the filter when you go out to run it. That way, after you run it, you can tell if it's actually leaking. Okay, run it up and uh, make sure it's not leaking. Um, so, and then... Once you're done with that, the final check is going to be to make sure, obviously, your oil sump is closed, which if it's not at this point, you're going to be leaking oil all over. But I always like to lay eyes on the oil sump because we did mess with the oil sump or the, the valve to drink the oil out of the oil sump. I like to double check that, make sure it's closed, make sure it's not leaking out of the bottom in the cowl. And then I like to check the filter, make sure it's not leaking. Then you cowl it up. Cowl it up, you're done. Um, do logbook entries. And uh, you just... When you do a logbook entry, you just say, uh, changed aircraft, if you're the pilot, changed aircraft oil with uh, 11 quarts Phillips XC 20W50, um, replaced oil filter with Tempest 48 uh, 110-2, uh, old oil filter inspection was satisfactory, leak check of the engine was satisfactory, <clears throat> then end. That tells you the people that it's the end of your entry and no one can sabotage your entry and write something after it. So you put end, and then you put PPL or CFI or whatever, COM, whatever your commercial, private, whatever your license is as a pilot, put the initials at the beginning and then the number, and then sign it with your signature, okay? All right, so 
if you don't want to do oil changes, if that sounded like a pain in the butt, call Phalanx. Uh, that's what we do. We're mobile aircraft maintenance. We can do oil changes, no problem. We have mechanics in all 50 states. We're always expanding our network. So if we don't have a mechanic in your state, we'll try to find someone to, to help you out. Um, go to phalanxaviation.com. Uh, use the state selector. Go to find aircraft mechanics. Select your state. Submit a maintenance request. If it's an oil change, ask for an oil change, and the mechanic can do an oil change for you. Um, and with that being said, that's going to end this episode on aircraft oil. Uh, make sure you hit like or subscribe if you want to uh, follow up with me on the next episode of oil filters and oil analysis. We'll kind of dive deep into Tempest versus Champion. We'll talk about uh, what it looks, what oil filter, what a good oil filter looks like. Um, when you're doing the oil change, what a bad one looks like, you know, when there's a lot of metal in it and what kinds of metals you should be looking at that are bad. So with that being said, I appreciate you guys tuning in and we'll see you guys next time on Phalanx Frequency.